Again, at the bottom of the page, if you have it, uh, have a copy of the notes down there at the bottom. There's a, uh, a number 10 is to search premillennialism, and that is, again, um, as you can kind of see, if you can make it out on the screen here, I know it may be small for some, but uh, that is the playlist. That's what this is called. It's not telling you to search that. That's actually what you would go to YouTube and type in, search premillennialism, and uh, that would pull up, you know, eight, nine, or ten videos that cover. Last week, we'd watched the very first one, uh, and then tonight, I was going to touch on just a couple of things. We, if you had your notes and you were with us last week, we made it about through number five, so what I'd like for us to do tonight is watch a couple of these, hopefully kind of whet your appetite. Again, they're about four to six minutes. Uh, and then also, we're having to use the TV right now. We've got, uh, hopefully, over the next couple of days, things that will be installed. And we'll get back up and running with uh, more sound and the projectors and all. But uh, hopefully this will work out a, enough and allow us to, to kind of enjoy what Don has to say about these things. With The first one we're going to watch is The Sign of the Times. I touched on that last week. And then I was going to show the one about Mark of the Beast. Uh, and then we were going to talk about a couple of other things that aren't on this piece of paper uh, that uh, kind of go along with this, this same thought process here. So uh, anyways, I'll try to get it cranked up and the sound enough where you can hear it. But if there's a little bit of issue, it, these won't take too long here to start us. People will...
there on watching the videos. I think they're encouraging and certainly uh, the work that Don does is very good as well with uh, a lot of this and I would encourage you, it, you can use these as much as you want. Go back and, and view these things and think about them more and more. Uh, but just in case you weren't with us last week, uh, we've been talking about for several months now the idea of uh, things that we teach, why we teach certain things. We use, of course, the spiritual sword that talked about a lot of different things. Uh, things like once saved, always saved, or things like our worship, uh, and not using instruments in our worship, and those kinds of things, uh, several different things. The Holy Spirit, we talked about several different uh, topics, and so Charles and I were talking about going a little further with a few others, and we said if you've got any suggestions, by all means let us know, and we would love to, to move on with uh, some things that maybe you have questions about. Uh, we've come up with a few, and one of those was this idea of a, a brief study of premillennialism. So when you think about the, the book of Revelation, you think about premillennialism, a lot of folks just kind of stay away from it because it seems really difficult, really deep. We can't understand it. We can't know. And so we're just not going to talk about it. But uh, again, the notes that I've, I've kind of given you here are very uh, brief and you can't, you know, without kind of having been a part of the discussion, it may be hard to take it and run with it. But again, let me point out to you at the bottom, not only is there uh, the YouTube series here by Don, but also a link, which of course you can't click on, on the piece of paper. Nobody go home and try to like poke on it, right? Nobody does that. Uh, but there's also kind of a hyperlink there that was uh, to a Christian Courier article our brother Wayne Jackson uh, had written that's very detailed. It's kind of what I've been using for some of my notes to, um, to help us think about um, you know, a, a lot of topics. So they touched on, or Don touched on in these videos, the mark of the beast and the idea of uh, he touched on the Antichrist a little bit. I'd like to come back. The idea of the rapture, the signs of the times. I even mentioned to those who were here last week that at the bottom of that playlist, and I didn't have the playlist pulled up, but they had even added on over the last two years a video onto this topic about COVID and what people have said about COVID and whether that the coronavirus was the sign of the end of the times or these kinds of things. And so it's another fairly short one, but a lot of people ask these questions and they think about these things. So real quick, if you have your notes in front of you, just to kind of try to do a brief uh, touch on what we talked about. Of course, the theory is that Christ came to earth he tried to set up his kingdom, but he was rejected by the Jews. That was unexpected. God didn't expect that. Jesus didn't expect that. So now they're left going, huh, what are we going to do now? We need a plan B. So plan B was to postpone the kingdom and to establish the church. And so then now we take things or they take things from the book of Revelation and create this large theory that deals with the idea that Jesus, when he returns, will raise only the righteous. That's kind of the idea of the rapture. Uh, then he will restore national Israel. We talked last week for just a few moments about this idea of what people get hung up on with the Middle East and Palestine and the land territory. And again, I mentioned, you know, whether it was Bush or Obama or, or Trump or Biden, what they're doing and what they, the decisions they've made, how we recognize this, you know, area and these people as the United States of America. And then Christ is going to sit on David's throne and reign for a thousand years. So last week we touched on the first few things in the notes. That number one, there's a, a, a really big problem with the idea of the rejection of Christ. Um, first of all, it just flies in the face of passages like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 118, where it clearly talks about the fact that he would be rejected. Uh, I don't know where you go in your faith or what you think when you start talking about the idea that God is surprised, that maybe there's things that God doesn't know or can't know, and so he just, oh, I can't believe that they did this, that these humans made this decision or, or caused this to happen. Uh, and so Christ's rejection was not this, uh, as I wrote in your notes there, an unexpected miscarriage in the plans of God. That just kind of, again, flies in the face of a lot of what Scripture has to say. We also talked about the fact that clearly Daniel, uh, John the Baptizer, I didn't write that out there, but uh, the reference to Matthew 3, Matthew 4, but that's John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. Daniel, even coming to the New Testament, John, Jesus, Peter, and Paul all talk about the kingdom having, well, Daniel talks about the kingdom coming. We get to Acts 2 and the establishment of the church there, and then everyone else is talking about the kingdom has come. And, of course, John and Jesus fit into that pre-Acts 2 as well, obviously. And they're saying the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Peter and Paul are talking about that the kingdom has come. 
And, uh, and so that's kind of a big deal here when that's the first thing that I said there at the top of your notes. Christ came to set up his kingdom, and there's this big discussion of the kingdom. Uh, number four on your notes, if you have them, but the church. Paul writes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 3 that, you know, this was God's plan. Um, that the church was a part of his plan, and so when we start talking about, again, that this was sort of a plan B or a backup and punt, uh, but he says there, you know, that to the intent now, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. And so just very encouraging that to even think about verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, and so the church... It's why it's important to us. It should be important to us. It's been important to God. It's important to Christ. And it's sort of, we, you hear people say sometimes, the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, there's some truth to that. That we are to be the plan to carry out the mission of Christ, which was to seek and save the lost. The Great Commission. You know, once again, not only was Christ not defeated at the cross, but he also wasn't defeated when it came to his, you know, ascending back into heaven, his leaving. It wasn't this, well, it's time for me to ascend. What are we going to do now? I'm not sure how we're going to get this accomplished. Don't know what's going to happen. No, leaving the church as the bride of Christ and the opportunity to then, again, share the gospel, to spread the good news, to seek and to save the lost. Uh, we talked about God's promise to Abraham just a little bit, number five there that it was a conditional promise that was fulfilled. And I talked about the fact that Jeremiah gives a visual aid, uh, that it was a... Let's try to get back to the reference there. I couldn't find it last week. But it's Jeremiah 19, Jeremiah 19, verse 11. The idea of a potter's vessel being broken, and it can't be assembled again. And that was going to be the nation of Israel. They were going to be scattered. They were not going to be able to be made whole Again, and that is uh, Jeremiah's visual aid. Of course, Christ talks about the idea um, that Israel would never be restored. Um, and he talks about that in Matthew 21. The idea that uh, the kingdom of God, that their reign, the Jews' reign as God's special people, uh, shall be taken away from you and it shall be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And so Christ even made this pronouncement. And then the one thing that we kind of, this is where we kind of left off, was the idea of uh, the throne of David. And that is that the largest problem, and I think Don said it again in one of these, but the question is regarding whether or not we're talking about material things or spiritual things. The question is not whether Christ was to sit on the throne of David, the controversy is concerning whether or not that throne was the material throne or the spiritual throne. And again, with premillennialism, they're caught up in this literal throne, you know, the, the actual ground in Palestine, the temple, and we're not talking about material things, we're talking about spiritual things. And so, you know, the God's promise to Abraham, uh, there are several things that point to the fact that that was... Uh, what we're talking about, what Christ was talking about in, uh, in Scripture, in His words. Uh, the resurrection. So if you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Let's examine a few of these in at least a little bit of detail. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. So you've heard me say, and others, I mean Don say here, that certain things are not found in Scripture. Okay, that, you know, he, he said it in the video there, uh, that the, some of these ideas are not found, not just in Scripture, but he said primarily, I think, in the book of Revelation. Let me make sure I try to clarify there. Some of this is not in the book of Revelation. So, Revelation 20, in verses 1 through 6, you see there at the end of verse number 2 that there is a mention of a thousand years. So, I don't want you to misunderstand and think, well, Joel said none of this is in the Bible. No, some of this is found in the Bible. The word a thousand years is certainly found in the Bible. I'm not trying to deny that. Don even pointed out the passage that says 666. That's found in the book of Revelation. So not denying that, just the idea of what the context is or what it is meaning. So based mostly upon a misunderstanding of this particular passage, premillennialists urge or try to teach that there will be two resurrections of the dead. The first will be at the time of Christ's coming. This is the idea of the rapture, that the, the first time will occur at Christ's coming and will consist of the righteous only. 
right? We talked about it last week. People drive around with that bumper sticker. You know, in case of rapture, this vehicle will be unoccupied or whatever, that, that kind of thing, because they're saying, you know, I'm a Christian or I'm righteous. So when the rapture occurs and Christ comes the first time and the righteous are taken, then that's what we are talking about. The second thing then, after this thousand year reign, will be the second resurrection of the wicked followed by the judgment. Now again, do you see there that it says a thousand years, chapter 20 and verse number 2, but there's some other things that we must consider. Uh, number one, look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23, the end, again, if you have the notes, that's the section we're in, the end. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23, Paul speaks of the coming of Christ. That's what we're talking about. With reference to that event, Paul says, then cometh the end, in verse 24, then cometh the end. It is obvious that the return of Christ is not to begin an earthly reign. Rather, it will bring to end the earthly affairs. And again, he, Brother Jackson mentions in his article here, there's some, some Greek language and some verb tense that some people will try to get into, but I'm going to be willing to say that you know, 99% of the people we talk to, maybe for most of us, 100, nobody's going to point out a Greek adverb and you know, what exactly it's meant. But, but the end is what Paul is talking about here. It's not the beginning, but it is the end when Christ comes. The second thing we would see then is the day. Jesus spoke of the day in which he would be revealed, the day of his coming. And in presenting this truth, the Lord referred to two divine destructions of former ages. And so observe that, and turn to Luke 16. Let me give you the reference there, sorry. Kind of left that hanging. Luke 17, verses 26 through 30. Jesus spoke of the day in which he would be revealed, and in presenting this truth, he spoke to two divine destructions of times past. Luke 17, 26 through 30. Notice there we're talking about the time of Noah. He mentions the days of Noah. So it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. Likewise, also, verse 28, as it was also in the days of Lot. So these are the two divine destructions that Jesus references as he's talking about the day. Observe that on the day that Noah entered the ark, the world, the pre-flood world, was destroyed. Furthermore, in the day that Lot departed Sodom, the people of the plain cities were destroyed. So also, right here, Christ is contending that in like manner, in like manner, so shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. And the implication seems to be that the past, in this passage is that the wicked will be destroyed in the day of Christ's coming. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of room here for this thousand years that's going to come between this, these times. No thousand year interval. So also, so we have the end, we have the day. Let's talk very quickly about the hour. And if you have your Bible, look in John chapter 5. Again, if you're making notes, I can give you any of these other references. If you don't jot them down, I'm not intending to. Uh, I only have so much room there to try to fit all that in. But go ahead, sir. Before you go to that yeah. point, let's, let's say something about this Noah and Lot and that sort of thing. You talk to people sometimes, and this is a, somewhat of a parallel passage to Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about how two women will be uh, grinding at the mill, one mm -hmm. will be taken, one will be left. Well, that's what they hang their hat on as far as the rapture. But when he expounds on it here and uses some specific examples of Noah and Lot, it, it's talking about how the righteous were saved, as in Noah and his family and Lot and his family, versus the wicked. Okay, so I think it's it's good that you know Luke records the Holy Spirit through Luke records this expounding on the same kind of point that Jesus is talking. About. Yeah, absolutely, and and. He touched on Matthew 24. I wish we had time. Charles has led us in that discussion a little bit before. Maybe we might can talk about that and come back, but that's a, a great point. As he was saying, and really Charles just has laid out for us, I know um, what Don basically said, which is there are two questions there, and the idea there are two answers. 
And one's talking towards, as they say, well, what about this temple? They just left the temple. What about this? And he gives those 34 verses or so of, of description about that destruction, that no stone shall be left upon another. And then there's a change. There is a shift in his talking uh, where he kind of says then separately, uh, and you can you know, read it as you think about uh, Verse 24, but then he, or excuse me, chapter 24, but then he even uses the word but, you know, the shift to now when I'm going to return, when Christ shall return, there's, there's you know, there's no, no man knoweth. And in, in a couple, couple with in with that is that life is going to be going on. Yes. Just as usual, just like when the rain started, life had been going on as usual. And when God called destruction on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, life had been going on as usual. That's the point. Yeah. Yes, we have the time we're blessed with. We don't know when that time will come to an end, but, but yeah, we're continuing to live. Life, life is continuing on. T-Fry? Is it, is it just me or it seems opposite of what people also, the whole war and pestilence, and the same as he said in this video, hey, the end is coming. But what's mentioned here, marriages, it's opposite of the end. So what we bank on, Yes. What we bank on usually mention are wars, pestilence, those kinds of things, but there are other things that are mentioned. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's, I mean, we, it's easy sometimes as well to sit around and joke or poke fun at people who have made the predictions, right? And how many predictions there have been made over the years of, you know, but yeah, but as long as anybody is picking out this war, you know, or this virus, or this whatever, and saying that's it, you know, yeah, you're going to kind of keep missing, absolutely. So, Jerry? <clears throat> no, you're... <clears throat> Okay. And he pointed out these and those two expressions. Now I have those notes, uh, and, but if anyone could actually uh, pull that up. It should still be on there, shouldn't it? I mean, as far as. He talks about these and those, <coughs> talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and, but, but a lot of people can't make that transition around verse 30. Yes. But sometimes, when you can time, you may want to go into that because it's a big. Yeah. Yeah, some of you like to. Some, I mean, some of you like to watch things. Some of you like to try to, you know, watch videos or, or. And I don't care to ever suggest some of those. Again, this is kind of a brief or a real simple overview. But PTP three sixty five. You know, we push it a lot. But Brian would probably have to help you. We kind of did this when we first got the the note back about it, and we and the elders agreed. You know, we could sign up for it and use it. But PTP three sixty five. You got to sign up not pay anything, but you got to get a username and password. It's a few steps, but there are, I mean, thousands upon thousands of lessons, and we've got a username and password that can help get you started and get you in, and then you have to set up your own account, kind of, so to speak. Uh, but you could probably search for Alan Hires and probably search for Matthew 24. He just has an excellent way of, of presenting things. Yeah. People can understand it uh, because it's such an awesome Yeah, you could probably watch that lesson is what I was getting at because a lot of, almost everything they've done are there, so... Now, if you want to read Jerry's notes, you want Jerry's version, I'll leave that up to you. You can go sit in Jerry's feet. and, and <laughs> yeah, I'll pick it on Jerry. But, uh, yeah, good, lots of good material out there to, to consider. So, um, all right, so real quick here, then, the hour. Ma uh, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth they, that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. So this passage, again, kind of thoroughly negates the two resurrection theory. And what's interesting in my research of this is that not only does Brother Jackson in his article, but others will cite other preachers, other writers who struggle with parts of this. Uh, it may have been Miss Karen I was talking with last week after we were done, but I made mention, because Don mentioned last week in his video, the idea of Billy Graham. If you go to Billy Graham's website, it, and if I was on an updated page, then even it says about the rapture that some people say this and some people say that, and well, we just can't know. You know, we're not sure, and, and we don't know, and we can't say. Who can say? 
And so even though maybe he's been known for preaching those kinds of things, you'll see some who will say, well, I really struggle. So real quick, that was, again, he quotes in this article, but uh, one of the writers says, it is hardly possible to conceive a plainer statement than what Jesus says here of the simultaneousness of the resurrection of both, both the good and the evil. You know, I mean, it's plain. And so I don't know this guy and what all he teaches, but that's the kind of thing these people who teach these things will run up against. Part of it they might can make fit. Part of it's going to still seem like, well, I'm not sure how I handle that. Robert, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if anybody else in here has watched the Jerry McJay series. Okay. The series. Okay. 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 Some of those people going through that return to Christ, they'll be persecuted and die, and then they'll be raised and then come back down. Yeah. Uh, Gary McDade, right, is that what you were saying? Were those on YouTube? Do you remember, I think Gary McDade has done some on, on Revelation. There was another one I started watching today for a few moments that was done by, um, what's his name, Rob Whitaker. Uh, Rob Whitaker, who does some of the evangelism, the school of evangelism for house to house. But he has a book, I think, that he might have put together about Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, simplified. So this was on Posh in the Pulpit 365, PTP 365, but it was Revelation Simplified. And he was talking about how we look at some of these things. And, and uh, it was, it was, I didn't get to finish it, but it was a good start thinking about what we think of when we think of the book of Revelation. So real quick, that's the number seven down there if you have your notes. But going back to that passage, and if you have your Bibles, go to Revelation 1, Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Don touched on this in one of those for just a minute. But Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, there's a few things already that, that talk about, um, that point out the, this purpose uh, of and the form of the book of Revelation. The book begins the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice that it's singular. It's not plural. It's not the revelations. I know some people, I've heard them say that, like revelations is what they say. And some people don't even mean anything by that. Some people may mean that. They may mean that they think there's multiple revelations. Some people just say it because, you know, it's, maybe it's just kind of what you throw an S on things sometimes. But it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants that things which must shortly take place, and here's the thing, he sent and signified. Now, I can't remember if that was last week or another one of Don's videos where he points out sign, signified. The book of Revelation was written to the church of the apostolic age, which was being severely persecuted. And that's important to note when we think about the... Uh, purpose and form of revelation. In fact, in, in future years, it was subjected to a bloodbath. Really? I don't know if you've ever read about it, but it, it, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to read about sometimes. I think it's another one of Don's videos on here. He talks about that, that there were people who would, Jews, rich Jews who swallowed gold supposedly by some writings, not inspired writings, but by other writings who swallowed their riches you know, in a sense, to take it with them or to try to keep it away from, from those who were coming to persecute them. And then they would simply gut them to, to try to get that back. I mean, and so, we're, I mean, again, without trying to be too gross or anything, but literal bloodbath with the way it was for Christians during this early times. And that's kind of important as they're thinking about the persecution and the suffering they're going through. A book that's written as a sign with these signs is going to remind them that we have won the victory, that Christ has gained the victory, and that is the theme of the book. Also, the fact that the book is really heavily couched in the imagery of the Old Testament when you think about a lot of these things. And so the Christians were undoubtedly familiar with this kind of language, so the message of hope would be grasped by those early disciples. It's going to make sense to them. It really seems crazy to us, and all these things that we say in beast and candlesticks and monsters and all, I mean, the serpent and all these things, but it's going to make sense to them. They're going to understand it through this time of persecution. In fact, real quick, turn back to Revelation 20. We, we looked, noticed it just a moment ago there, but I gave you in the notes the idea of the symbols employed. 
Brother Jackson points out that an examination of the first six verses here of Revelation 20 shows these symbols. A key, verse 1, a chain, a dragon or a serpent, depending on the version maybe you have, an abyss, a thousand years, a beast, thrones, marks on foreheads and hands, and a resurrection. But the point that, that Brother Jackson makes in his article is, is that it is certainly a strange interpretation which contends that it's a figurative serpent, a figurative chain that is thrown into a figurative abyss, locked with a figurative lock that had a figurative key that's then going to be confined by a literal thousand years. And, you know, without really studying this, I, I, you know, you don't usually think about it that way. But they'll say, oh, well, the serpent and the abyss and a lot of these things are figurative, but yet there's a literal thousand years. And so, you know, it ought to be obvious that no literal reign of Christ upon the earth is what's alluded to here with this mention of a thousand years. Even if a person does not understand the specific design of the symbols, he can see the symbolic import of the thousand years. And also... Again, Revelation 20, 1 through 6, that's where a lot of people would have you turn. But I noticed, I made mention in your notes there, some omissions. This, if premillennialism is, is true, there's no mention here of Christ's second coming, the establishment of the kingdom, a, a, a bodily reigning of Christ, the throne of David, or the Jews being gathered in Palestine again. None of that's mentioned here. And so it's got to be then all these things are pulled together from various places. And we said it last week, but, but you'll find that people really sometimes don't even know what, what they're talking about or what they believe. Kind of back to what Robert was saying a few moments ago. Remember, I think Don had it last week, but there's a couple of main theories. One is called historical, I think, if I remember, historical premillennialism. And the other was called dispensational premillennialism. The dispensational premillennialism is what we're talking about. The historical is where people have these other ideas, and so some say there's a rapture, some say there's not. Would you say three different returns, is that what you're saying, or three different resurrections kind of deal? I mean, you'll get people who say different things. So hopefully this is kind of an introduction to some of this um, with just asking you, all of us, to consider what Scripture says. And if you don't know something... By all means, look up some of this material. I mean, you can come ask me. It may be that I've got to say, well, let's talk about it. You know, let's, let's dig into it. Let me do a little thinking and research and, and try to remember what's said. But the last thing I said there in my notes was it makes for great books, movies, conjecture, and more. But a lot of this is not found in the Bible. And let me give the caveat again. Some of it is found in the Bible. The idea of a thousand years is mentioned, 666. And we're going to talk about Antichrist in just a second but not in the way that people are teaching these things. Uh, so that's the end of our notes. I have a couple of other things I was going to point out, but we'll take any other comments or questions here. Robert? I just want to throw this out because I thought it was really interesting. Mark the beast, Jesus represents the emperor. Uh-huh. Uh, the beast, when John wrote this, but he kind of passed on to the clear of the next emperor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, some can't hear, maybe those watching online, but Robert's talking about a kind of a history lesson a little bit about the emperors that were involved and the way that number, the mark of the beast there, 666 was, 666 was used. And so that, I mean, that, you can spend a lot of time looking at it. I know Robert has. We've talked about it a little bit, but it's an interesting study. Charles? I was just going to say, back to Revelation 1, I 
I think it's what around the end of verse three says these things must shortly come to pass. Yeah. And what is it? Is it a thousand years from now or ten thousand years from now, or is it shortly come to pass? What do you you got to decide? And you've got to look at Revelation in context of what God has said everywhere else. Sure, there's a whole discussion there about, you know, um, in biblical interpretation, <laughs> looking at something. If, if this is going to contradict something else, then you've got to rectify that. And there's logical and, and you know, studying ways of doing that um, when you're studying Scripture. Because, you know, this says one thing and, and this says something else. How do we kind of get through that? And, and that's a whole another discussion for another time. We've only got about three or four minutes left here. Uh, turn over to First John. Uh, I just wanted to make mention, so Don's videos cover a lot of the highlights, the rapture, you, he listed them on there, the rapture, the tribulation, the mark of the beast, the sign of the times, um, but one thing that he mentioned, and you can hit it up real simple, 1 John and 2 John are the only passages in the Bible where the idea of antichrist is mentioned. It's like four passages, the word is actually used five times in four passages. And there's a couple of things to note. Uh, 1 John 2, 18 is one of those places. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, my, it's capitalized in the Bible I'm using. You know, again, you read that, you stop there, there's some questions probably about what other people say. But continue on. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it, it is the last hour hour. So you again kind of see some of these words that are used. Look down in verse 22, another place, the word antichrist is used there. And so again, it's, it's five times in four verses or four passages, but they're all used right here in these two books. Uh, 2 John verse 7 is another one there. Of course, only one chapter, so just verse 7, 2 John. But, but notice a couple of things. Number one, that there is no specific person. You know, if you read those left behind books and things, I told you I'd read, uh, you know, a couple back when I was in high school. They're, you know, again, very interesting stories, but they're going to talk about this world power or this emperor or something, you know, world leader. There's some descriptions, but there's no mention of a specific person. But in fact, in 1 John 2, 18, the idea of many antichrists. Brian, what were you going to say? Okay, all right. And if you search for Alan Hires Thousand. Alan Hires Thousand, if you're interested. And again, you, you see Brian, you can see myself, but you know, if you want to go there and you've not done it before, it requires just a little bit of work to get logged in. But we'd glad, gladly help you because there's a lot of good things on there. So real quick then on Antichrist, no specific person, rather many. But then what it's talking about is not a sinister person, not some sinister figurehead or face, but it's sort of a general disposition of unbelief. So we might say that they're antichrist right now. Maybe not in this room, but certainly in the world or in Saudi Daisy or Tennessee or whatever. There are people who have a general disposition of unbelief. unbelief. And when I talk to you about uh, the idea that the world's not really any worse today than maybe it's been before, that we sometimes lament that, I sometimes do think that that's where a lot of this is. There are maybe more people that just simply fall into unbelief today than a long time before. There have always been unbelievers, but, and there always, I guess, will be as long as this earth is standing, as we know, until Christ returns and every knee shall bow. But it's interesting that there are a lot of people that just don't care. They just don't believe. And we might label them as antichrist. Not a sinister person, not one, not specific, but many in this general disposition there. Uh, so that's a lot, <laughs> and it's kind of heavy, uh, but I hope that if you're really interested in this, that you'll take these resources and, and go further, um, and if you're not, you can take it and leave it there, uh, but it is helpful to at least have uh, kind of a cursory knowledge of these things, maybe to discuss with someone, and let me remind you, we said this last week, this is, <laughs> this is not going to be the best way to study the Bible with someone to help them understand what it means to become a Christian. However, it may be a way to help someone see or look and say, well, just maybe what I've always heard the Bible says, the Bible doesn't exactly say because we can take passages out of context and make them say something they don't say. And of course, my example is always, right, that the Bible says there is no God, but that that's in a passage that says the fool has says, the fool hath says there is no God. 
So, I mean, that's, that's the deal. We've got to look at the context. It's not the best way to study with somebody, but it might be a good way to open the door to really examining what Scripture says about things and then moving into things of salvation and baptism and such. So, appreciate your comments and attention through uh, this good study, and then we'll pick up next week. We got lights, we got Jeff. We got screens, everybody's got their own screen. Yeah. <laughs> If you'll take out your screens, we'll start with uh, 870. I always do that backwards. The invitation will be 714. I don't know why I don't just announce that first. Make everybody flip around. 714 will be our uh, invitation song. And we'll sing 870 before Jeff has our prayer. I'm happy today, oh yes, I'm happy today, in Jesus Christ, I'm happy today, because he's saved.
Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we are happy today that you have taken away our sins. We're thankful that we've come to know you as the Father through baptism and had our sins washed away. Father, we realize that there's some that may not have made that decision yet, and we're praying for them that they will continue to study and look into your word and determine for themselves that this is something that they want for themselves. Father, we recognize that we don't know the day or the hour that we may be called to give our lives. We don't know the future. We don't know how long this earth will stand. As we've studied about tonight, no man knows the day and the hour when the earth will be destroyed. But Father, we do know we have tonight, we do know we have today, and that we should make the most of the opportunities that we have today so that we can all be singing and happy and praying to you and rejoicing in the salvation that we find through knowing Jesus. Father, we're thankful for this privilege to be here this evening. We're thankful that we're able to get out and in be able to assemble with brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we're thankful for our, the media that will allow us to broadcast our services, but it's, as I know from being at home myself during COVID, it's just not the same thing. It's so much better to see our brothers and sisters <coughs> inter interact and have fellowship one with another and encourage each other. And Father, we all need enc encouragement. We all have struggles. We have those that are going through physical struggles, tests, biopsies, waiting for results, surgeries, and we're very happy that Hudson made it through his surgery well and, and is recovering well, and we pray for him and his family as he continues to do so. We pray for these others that are going through different things and MRIs that are coming up and a host of different issues that affect our health, and we're praying for each one of these individuals also, we pray for the, the Smith family and the passing of our brother Bob's sister. And we know that this was a very tough week for him, and we pray that you would be with him and bless him and bless his family and his extended family. Father, we are happy that we're Christians and we're able to be here tonight. We pray that you will continue to have mercy upon us, forgive us of our sins when we recognize that we have failed you and repent of those things. Help us to take account of ourselves when we're doing things and making decisions to make sure we are making the right decisions in accordance with your will and help us to do things that we know is right to do and not sin by not doing things that we know we should have. Father, we pray for our families. We pray that you will bless them, those that are here with us and those that are not. We pray that you would give us opportunities to not only teach our families and our community and the world over, we're thankful for this congregation that, that has missionaries and mission efforts that, across the, the world. And we pray that our elders will continue to make these decisions in accordance with your will and in accordance with each other. We're so thankful for a strong eldership and for the individuals that have become elders and given so much of their time and lives to dedicated to you. In this, in this job, this role. We know it is a job, and we, we pray that you will continue to bless them and bless their health and help us as members to be good members and, and help them to make their job easier. Help us all to do the best we can each and every day, looking to you for our faith and guidance. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, when we have our services, usually when we have our screens that have been working before at the end of our Sunday services, at least usually I have a slide that I always throw in at the end of the PowerPoint at the end of the lesson, and it's entitled God's Simple Plan of Salvation. The song we're about to sing in a moment is what many would consider an old favorite, right? An old standard kind of deal, the idea of trust and obey. Many people know this song, but just the simplicity of the lyrics are so wonderful in the chorus when we sing, for there's no other way. And that's why we entitle that, God's Simple Plan of Salvation, because we can complicate things a whole lot in our lives. We have family, and we have friends, and we have things that get in the way. We have emotions. We have our own desire, what we would rather do that get in the way, but there's no other way. We can think of a lot of different things we might suggest. 
think of a lot of things that people say, but there's no other way than to trust and obey in him. And it really is simple. I've said before, I, I reckon that God in his infinite power could have chosen anything for us to do, but he's given us his word. He's given us what we need to do, words by which we can be saved. We study those. We know those. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, you've never been obedient, and you have questions, we'd love to study with you as soon as possible. You see, no one has to leave with that care and concern on their mind or on their heart. There are lots of things that are going on in life. There are lots of things that get us down, lots of struggles, things with our family, things with our friends, health issues, and things like that that are going on. But no one has to leave with that kind of care and concern, wondering what would happen if your life were to come to an end or if the Lord were to return. You don't have to worry. You can know. You can have hope. You can have peace. The Bible speaks about that in so many places. But all we have to do is trust and be gospel obedient. Obey the gospel. Participate with Christ in that death, burial, and resurrection. And again, if you're here tonight and you're not familiar with that or you'd like to know more, we'd study with you as soon as possible. Maybe you're here tonight and you've done that in times past, but you have wandered away. See, I got my songs out of order a few moments ago, but I've been looking ahead. And, and the last song we're going to sing, 430, in just a few moments is... My name is in the book of life. Uh, I'm glad that we're singing it at the end because we're going to take a moment here in just a second to sing Trust and Obey, but to give you an opportunity that as you sing that last song, My name is in the book of life, you don't have to not sing it. You don't have to pretend to sing it but not want to sing it because you know that you're not right with God. I love that song because of its the, the melody and the tempo and the beautiful words, but you can sing with conviction with meaning. I know. I know my name is written there. We take this opportunity at the end of each service on Sunday and again tonight to stop and ask you to consider your life. As we're here tonight, there are many things again that are going on. It's what we call the middle of our week, and there are so many things sometimes that fill our mind. We pause for a few moments, we study God's Word, we see one another, we encourage one another, and we sing a song such as this. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, you cannot sing with conviction, my name is in the book of life. Why delay? Simply trust and obey. Put on Christ in baptism. Allow his blood to wash away your sins. You can be added to the church and you can begin to live faithfully. Again, maybe you're here tonight and you've done that. You know the healing power of the blood of Christ. But you're simply struggled with other things. Maybe it's sin, sin of a public nature that you'd like to come forward to the front in a public way and make that known. Maybe it's not of a public nature in that way, but you'd still like to come forward and make it known to your brothers and sisters that we can pray with you and for you. There's no greater feeling sometimes than to be unburdened of these things, to know that you've got the prayers of those around you and that you can leave singing for sure. My name is in the book of, li my, the book of life. I know it is written there. We're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful you're here and that we can sing to encourage you if you need to become a Christian or come back to him even now as we stand together and as we sing.
Be seated, please. We're thankful again that you're here this evening, thankful for the opportunity to encourage ourselves with uh, study, and we try to say this at least periodically, but if there's anything that you have heard or observed in our services that you have a question about, we'd love an opportunity to answer that with a Bible answer uh, for the things that we do and the things that we say. Uh, we've been trying to teach that on Wednesday night here lately, but we certainly mean it, and we're just thankful for your attendance this evening. As far as our sit go, a few updates that we have for you. Uh, Steve Fugit uh, received results from his scan that he is uh, stable, uh, that there was no new growth. His platelet count was up. So I know Debbie and Steve both were thankful for some good news there. We want to continue to pray uh, for him and for Debbie. Uh, Joe sent me a note, uh, gave me a note that said that Betty is still recovering from her biopsy uh, and that she has radiation that starts on Monday and it will go all week next week. So it'll be a lot for her, I know, and for Joe. We want to pray for uh, Betty Varner uh, in particular leading up to next week. Uh, Carl and Midge were away from us on Sunday. I think they've been feeling ill some. We want to continue to mention them. Uh, John Graves, Faith is not with us tonight. Uh, you can add to that list uh, her Aunt Betty Parton. She's actually with her. Took her to some eye surgery today. Her Aunt Betty had eye surgery and said things went well. Uh, and she said John is still doing okay uh, with his kidney stone. I've uh, been taking medicine and, and being seen. So we want to continue to pray for uh, all of them. Faith is not with us tonight, but hopefully back soon. A couple of additions to our sick list, not necessarily members here, uh, but Mary Stewart, who is the sister-in-law of Vicki Newberry, and some of you know uh, Philip and Aaron Stewart, who have visited here with us before. This is Philip's mother. Uh, had surgery, extensive surgery, about a week ago, I think, and is still having a hard time after that uh, and has been diagnosed with, with several things going on, and so we'd like to ask you to pray for Mary Stewart. Uh, also, uh, if you would add to your prayer list Haley Jackson. Haley is a, a young girl, 12 or 13, maybe a little older than that. She goes to Bible camp with us at Camp McCroy. Uh, she went to another camp after McCroy and was in the pool, and somebody jumped without seeing her and landed on top of her. And that's been several weeks ago, but she's continued to have trouble, some weakness and some pain. She's been checked out several times and been okay, but then had to go back. But they did an MRI on her over the end of last week and weekend and discovered she does have a lesion on her brain. They did a spinal tap, trying to rule out lots of different things. They are members at Lafayette, I believe, the Jackson family. But Haley Jackson, again, a young girl, 13, 14, 15, if you would just add her to your prayer list, then uh, we would appreciate that. Um, I had one other thing written down here. I know our kids don't want to hear it, but a lot of them are going back to school or have started in the last couple of days. We've got, of course, a few teachers amongst us as well, and I know uh, they're not sick or anything, at least not yet. I hope not at school, but uh, we certainly want to pray for all of our students and our teachers uh, as they begin a new school year, and we can add them to our prayer list. Was there anyone else we had as far as our sick go that we need to update on? All right, as far as our other announcements go, uh, don't forget the, the mention that's been in the bulletin for the note from the elders, uh, putting Brian Sorello's name before the congregation to serve in our eldership. If you have any questions about that, you can see our elders. Uh, Saturday at the Browns, still on for right now. Uh, so you see, uh, Julie, if you have any questions about that, Saturday at their house. Uh, don't forget that on Sunday, we will host the teen singing. Uh, well, let me back up. I was kind of trying to take these in chronological order. There is a piece of paper on the table in the foyer. We're going to try on Sunday to do sandwiches, right? Would that be the way of saying it? A sandwich meal for lunch. We've always kind of done the potluck since we started our lunch between our services, but we're going to try to do kind of a theme, at least for this Sunday. We've kind of, people have talked about that before. If you'd like to stay, if you do stay for our lunch, sign up that on that sheet of paper uh, for the things that are associated with that. If you have any questions, you can see Hannah, um, but we're going to try that for this Sunday and see how that goes. So instead of a potluck, you can bring things associated with sandwiches, and then uh, you can also bring dessert as normal. I think that's written on there as well. Bob? About Brian, yes, on Sunday morning. Yeah, that was the note from the elders in the bulletin. Absolutely, so keep, keep that in mind. Uh, Sunday afternoon, don't forget that we have the teen singing that we're hosting. We hope to have uh, a good number, sometimes 60, 70 or so folks from the area. And so we will have our 1.30 service after lunch, and that will be somewhat abbreviated. And we'll try to be done a little after 2 so that our, as our guests come in, they can come in the auditorium. But as Charles made mention on Sunday, we'd love for you to stay all day. Come and be a part of Bible class at 930. 
service, lunch, service, and then the teen singing. If you've ever been a part of a teen singing, it is very encouraging uh, to do that. Don't forget on the table, there's also a sign-up sheet for that. I had someone ask me, if you have signed up for something for the teen singing, that doesn't have to be here tonight, but please try to have it here on Sunday morning so we make sure that everything is accounted for. So, the moral of the story is, as you leave, you need to check that table as you walk by. There was a youth truth, there was uh, some calendars as well from the GCCS for next year. If you like one of those each year, you can pick up one of those. Uh, lots of information out there, including the sign-up sheets for lunch and for the teen singing on Sunday. What else? We miss anything else? Lots of good things that we're thankful for. Brother Tom? Care Team 2 will meet Sunday, so don't sneak out. Don't miss that. Tom will hunt you down if, uh, if you miss out on that. Care Team 2 will meet Sunday afternoon as well. Anything else? If not, we hope, or Julie? At 5, thank you. 5 o'clock at her house. 5 o'clock on Saturday, if you can be a part of that. Uh, we're thankful you're here tonight, but we certainly want to see you again on Sunday morning for our Bible class time at 930 and for worship and everything else following after that on Sunday. After our closing song, Lance has our closing prayer. Let's be standing, please. My Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, thanking you for the blessings of this day, and we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we've all been able to come here together and gather and, and uh, study your word and sing these songs. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings you give us and the love you've shown us. We, uh, we thank you for everybody that's just able to be here and those who aren't able to be here for whatever reason, we ask you to be with them. And, and uh, if they're sick, we ask Heavenly Father that they will get better and be able to return here with us. And we, uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father, so much for your word that we can study and know that our name is written there. And that we strive to walk in the light as you've directed us, that we can have assurance of that home in heaven. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to 
be with everyone. Hope everybody gets home safely tonight and watch over us. Bring us back at the next quarter time. Amen. <laughs>